Hi everyone, this is just a quick lecture about the story of an hour and some of the material covered in week one. So why did I have you read a story and then cover information about the Freytag Pyramid when this is a creative writing class? Well, if you're going to write, you need to know about form and theory of your chosen genre. Chosen genre, say that three times fast. Um, and with the genre of fiction, the Freytag pyramid tends to be the typical structure of a story involving conflict. Um, and in Chopin's *The Story of an Hour*, we have a protagonist in conflict. Um, as we see in the first paragraph, knowing that Mrs. Mallard was a Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with a heart with a heart trouble, um, which sets us up for the background information we need to know uh, for the story, the exposition, great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. That's the problem. Um, the exposition continues, as you can see, the exposition continues it through the second paragraph, giving us just the background information that we need to know in order for the story to take place, the plot to, to thicken, as it were. Then after that, um, we have a series of causally related events that um, increase in intensity as we get closer to the turning point or climax of the story. Now, um, with any story, you generally have a protagonist. The protagonist, uh, you always have a protagonist, whether it's a person or not, but generally that protagonist has a desire an overwhelming need that must be net, met. Um, and then there are repeated obstacles that this protagonist must overcome in order to try to meet or to accomplish that desire. Eventually, the climax occurs and that desire is either realized or it is thwarted. Either way, these causally related events are the protagonist's it are um, events that occur as the protagonist tries to overcome obstacles to satisfy that desire. So essentially it's protagonist desire conflict, or excuse me, protagonist desire um, hurdle that they have to overcome. Desire, obstacle, desire, obstacle, overcome it, next obstacle. Um, so that's the case here again with Mrs. Mallard. Her obstacle, uh, or what her desire is, is to be free. She doesn't know that until her husband, um, is she, until she's told that her husband is dead. Um, and then as she realizes uh, that she could possibly be free, the more she realizes she wants it. Um, and then, of course, the story ends ironically. But we'll get to that. So again, after the exposition and the presentation of the problem, we get into the the complications or rather the obstacles or the causally related events that the protagonist must endure. And so um, down into the third paragraph as you can see um, the we get a bit of description here and notice how the writer, how Chopin is showing rather than telling. Also note that the point of view is from Mrs. Mallard's point of view however it is not from her point of view in first person it is third person. She did not hear um, and they uh, were trying to decide how to tell her. So we, we know Mrs. Mallard's thoughts but it is not from her first person point of view. It is still limited omniscient. So um, when the storm of grief had spent itself she went away to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. So we have a what the writer refers to a storm of grief. And then there has literally been rain outside that has also passed. Um, there stood facing the open window a comfortable roomy chair, which is ironic because she's in a small room. She's in a, conf conf she had been in a confining marriage. So this roomy armchair is, is like her freedom. Into this she sank, pressed down by physical exhaustion that haunted her body and seemed to reach into her soul. And then this portion here, she could see in the open square before her house the tops of trees that were all quiver with the new spring life, just like she will have a new life sans her husband. The delicious breath of rain was in the air, so the rain has come and gone, just as her storm of grief has passed. So this scene is not only one that we see as readers because the writer is showing, it is also one that is symbolic, um, just as she is seeing this new spring life. She's facing the west 
um, of her window that's the you know end of the day where we can see the sun coming down um, this blue sky is also symbolic of her freedom um, we see the blue sky patches of blue sky were, were showing through the clouds and again later her gaze was fixed off yonder on one of those patches of blue sky she can foresee a future without her husband a future of freedom just as she can see patches of sky so you note here how the writer is not only giving us scenes that we can actually see with our senses and and you know we can smell the rain we can we can visualize this scene it's also symbolic it, it corresponds w along with what the protagonist is experiencing emotionally so you know as she has this realization that she's going to have a new life she did love her husband um, but not really <laughs> she she had loved him at times her freedom is going to be more dear to her and of course later we have this uh, little bit of foreshadowing here kind of a clue that things are are not going to be quite as we hoped but she saw beyond that bitter moment a long procession of years to come that would belong to her absolutely that's ironic that's what we think that's what she thinks however as we know now that we've read the story that will be thwarted so and then all of these events build up to the final climax the ultimate turning point and the turning point um, or the the conflict um, arrives and once that happens of course it an action has to be coupled with that conflict but once it happens there's no turning back the protagonist is permanently changed and here is the scene that corresponds with that change so it was Brintley Mallard who entered a little travel stain composed composedly carrying his grip sack and umbrella he had been far from the scene of the accident and did not even know there had been one so this is the tension is building and building and building and here's where it is realized this is the climax this is the moment where things change permanently and cannot change back for our protagonist he stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry at Richard's quick motion to screen him from the view of his wife now the irony here is cosmic because as we see in the resolution when the doctors came they said she had died of heart disease of the joy that kills so it is ironic literally um, to the doctors because it's a joy that kills um, and it is a cosmic ir irony because despite her best intentions um, what she most desires and what she has most <laughs> uh, her her desire her most the thing that she has been working towards within the story was was um, was taken from her by the uh, ironic twist of fate that her husband was actually not dead so again um, it's very quick in the story normally you have a little more falling action such as in Cinderella and the example in the book um, you know they have they they get married uh, you know the 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 uh, wicked evil stepmother and the evil step ugly stepsisters get their comeuppance they get uh, blinded and they also loot get uh, birds are they come and peck out their eyes and they they are essentially get what's coming to them and then they also have you know they get married and live happily ever after we don't really get that this much in this story however um, we do have uh, a resolution here as you can see